Hello and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for this live stream event. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to review two items. Our code of conduct, uh, Microsoft Reactor seeks to provide a respectful environment for both our audience and our presenters. We encourage engagement in the chat, but we just ask that you're mindful of your commentary remaining professional on the topic. So this session is being recorded. It will be available on demand through the Microsoft Reactor YouTube channel in about 48 to 72 hours. I'll share the link to the channel in our chat momentarily. If you've not been on a live stream before, if this is your first time to engage in chats for most of the channels we're streaming to, you do need to have an account. So I would take this opportunity now to set that up or sign in just so that we can get all your questions answered while we're live. So today's session, Deploying Azure Resources with Python and Pulumi. Today we are joined by Jay Gordon, a cloud advocate here at Microsoft, and then Maddie Stratton and Kat Cosgrove are joining us from Pulumi. Uh, this is a exciting session. We have a lot of people here today and we're looking forward to getting started. So I'm gonna pull the speakers up. Hello everybody, welcome, welcome. Let me just pop my camera on here for a moment. Hey there. Hey, Rebecca. Um, thank you guys so much for doing this. We really appreciate you partnering with us and kind of running through it. I'm sure the audience is excited for it as well. Um, so just FYI, everybody out there in the universe, this session will go for about an hour, give or take, uh, depending on questions as well. Um, questions can be dropped into the chat throughout. We'll be happy to respond to them where there's an opening. and. I'll let you all take over from here. Cool. Hey, everybody. My name is Jay Gordon. I am a cloud advocate, as Rebecca uh, shared with everybody. I'm really glad to be here. I want to talk to you today about deploying Azure resources with Python and Pulumi. And I'm going to uh, say hello to our guests. Uh, first, Maddie. Hi, Maddie. How are you today? Hey, Jay. I'm, I'm doing, doing well. I'm getting ready for seven to 10 inches of snow here in Chicago uh, tomorrow. So doing well, good today. Terrible. Don't talk to me tomorrow. <laughs> that's terrible. And also joining us from the lovely Pacific Northwest is Kat Cosgrove. Hi, Kat. How are you? I'm good. It is a beautiful sunny day here in Seattle, which is mildly alarming. I'm pretty sure we're experiencing a fall spring. It is February. Should not be this warm and sunny, but I'm going to enjoy it while I've got it. <laughs> well, you know, we, we've got a few more months of winter left here in New York City, <laughs> and um, it's never going away. It is always going to be cold here, it feels like, except when it's nuclear hot, but that, that is what it is. So, you have two um, seasons? Yeah, we have nuclear hot, and oh my God, it's so cold. <laughs> uh, uh, so rather than talk about the weather, we're going to talk a little <laughs> bit about infrastructure as code. Um, and how to implement it using Python and Pulumi uh, in order to build your resources with Azure. Um, this session is going to be about an hour. So if uh, you're ready, uh, make sure you take some notes, make sure you take a look at all the links, and uh, hopefully you learn something really useful to help you start building. Uh, I am going to get us started with a, just a brief uh, reminder of an introduction to infrastructure as code. So let me bring this up. Uh, I'm going to just talk through this really fast because what Matt and Kat have to show me today is it's far more interesting, I think. But I <laughs> want to make sure that we're all on the same page. So infrastructure as code doesn't quite uh, trip off the tongue and it meaning isn't always straightforward. But infrastructure as code has been uh, with us since the beginning of DevOps. And some experts say that DevOps wouldn't be possible without it. And as the name suggests, infrastructure's code is the concept of managing your operations environment like you do for applications or other code for general release. Uh, so infrastructure is treated the same way any other code would be. The elasticity of the cloud paradigm and disposability of cloud machines can only be used by applying the principles of infrastructure's code to all of your infrastructure. Uh, so with infrastructure's code, you can capture your environment or environments in a text file, if you will, sometimes YAML, sometimes something else. Uh, your file might include network servers and other compute resources. You can check the script 
for definition file into uh, version uh, control or definition file, excuse me, into version control and then use it as the source for updating existing environments or creating new ones. Uh, for example, you can add a new server by editing a, the text file with your information in it and running the release pipeline rather than remoting into the environment, manually provisioning a new server. Uh, this table lists the significant differences between a manual deployment and an infrastructure's code one. Um, infrastructure as code uh, promotes auditing so that you can trace what was deployed, provides consistent environments from release to release, greater consistency across development, test and production environments, automates scale up and scale out processes, uh, allows configurations to be version controlled, provides code review and unit testing, uh, uses immutable service pro processes, meaning if a large change is needed to an environment, a new service is deployed and the old one is taken down, it isn't updated. Uh, allows for blue-green deployments so that we can swap out an existing uh, infrastructure a resource set of resources into a, uh, a brand new one, make some changes to our DNS, bring up our new app version. And it treats infrastructure as a flexible resource that can be provisioned, deprovisioned, and reprovisioned. Uh, so configuration management refers to automated configuration management typically in version controlled scripts for application and all the environments needed to support it. Uh, for example, adding a new port to a firewall could be done by editing a text file and running the release pipeline, not from going into Azure and adding it manually. Uh, manually changing the configuration of a single application and environment can be challenging. The challenges are even more significant for managing multiple applications and environments across multiple servers. So automated configuration or treating configuration as code can help with some of the manual configuration difficulties. Um, there are a bunch of benefits to configuration management. Bugs are easily reproduced, uh, provides consistency, uh, increase your deployment cadence, less documentation, enables automated scale up and scale out. Version control uh, helps uh, correct and uh, detect configuration drift, provides code review capabilities, uh, treats infrastructure also as a flexible resource and promotes automation. Um, so there are two different approaches. There is declarative. Uh, the declarative approach states what the final state should be when run, and uh, the script or definition will initialize and configure the machine uh, to have a finished state declared without defining how that should be achieved. Uh, how that, yeah, how that should be achieved. Uh, imperative, uh, in the imperative approach, the script states the how for the final state of the machine by executing the steps to get uh, to the finished state. It defines what the final state needs to be, but also includes how to achieve that final state. So uh, it can consist of coding concepts like if then loops matrices. Um, and the final thing that I will talk about is item potency. So it's the mathematical term that can be used in infrastructure as code and configuration as code. It is can apply more than one operations against a resource resulting in the same outcome. For example, running a script on a system should have the same outcome despite the number of times you execute the script. It shouldn't error out, it shouldn't do the same acts uh, or, or do the same actions irrespective of the uh, environment starting state. In essence, you apply deployment to a set of resources a thousand times, you should end up with the same result after each application of the script or template. So um, I, I think I've given you a really good short introduction to infrastructure as code and why it's useful. Uh, if you'd like to learn more, you can go over to Microsoft Learn. You can check out this module uh, about what infrastructure as code is uh, and, and how to get started using it. I think it'll really help you uh, get some foundation. So that's my introduction. And I hope um, you're ready because my guests are ready to give you <laughs> even more detail on infrastructure's code, how that uh, works alongside with Lumi, and uh, how we can use Python to create those resources.
Awesome. Thanks, Jay. Uh, fundamentally, nothing I, you know, would I asked Jay earlier when he was going to the slides. I'm like, am I allowed to argue with your slides if I disagree? And he said, I don't think you're going to disagree. And I was like, ah, a challenge, but I don't. Uh, but a couple of <laughs> things I, I, I want to touch on because they address into like why Pulumi is different and why we're going to talk about the things that, that we are. So uh, one of the things uh, I like to think about is we talk about infrastructure as code. And all the things that Jay said about infrastructure as code are true about infrastructure as code. Uh, with Pulumi, sometimes we think about this idea of infrastructure as software. And where this becomes different a little bit is um, what we've done all this time with things like Puppet and Chef and Ansible and Terraform and all these things. Like we, we took our code that defined our configuration and our systems and we treated it like code, but we didn't necessarily write it wasn't code. It wasn't software, right? It didn't have components or, you know, uh, conditionals or things like that. So the first bit of background to understand with Pulumi, and we're going to dig into this and show it to you, but with Pulumi, you write your infrastructure software or your infrastructure as code using a general purpose programming language like JavaScript or Go or .NET. You know, you want to write it in C Sharp. You want to write your infra code in VB.NET. Go for it, man. It's awesome. Or in Python, as we're going to address today, is that's what we're going to show. Everything we're doing today, using Python as an example, is exactly the same in the other uh, programming languages that Pulumi works with, uh, with the difference of that it's the flavor of the programming language, right? So like, you know, uh, but everything we're doing, if you are into C Sharp, nothing that Kat's going to show you or that we're going to work on today will fundamentally be any different. Uh, so that's one of the advantages, right? Like you already, number one, you have maybe knowledge and skill with this programming language, but also you have the whole ecosystem of that programming language, the IDEs, the testing tools, et cetera. Uh, and one other thing that's important to think about with Pulumi, uh, so Jay talked about imperative versus declarative, right? Which again, in the config management space, we like those words. We argue about that a lot. We argue about the word idempotent. We use those words a lot, which are fancy ways. Idempotent is a fancy way of saying a test and repair loop because that's basically what our infra code is doing. It's doing a test and repair. It's saying, is this the way that I want it to be? Yes, cool. No, fix it, right? So that's what we're doing. So Pulumi will look imperative because we are writing using uh, a general purpose programming language that is an imperative uh, way of addressing things, but Pulumi creates a declarative state. So you'll, it, it, and I know this sounds like I'm being very pedantic and I am a little bit, but the reason that matters is declarative is how you get item potence. Declarative is how you know you're going to get the same result every time. So what we are going to do today uh, is we said, okay, well, we're doing this thing on Reactor. Uh, Jay's an Azure uh, advocate. So, okay, cool. Let's build some Azure resources. That's that's rad. Uh, Kat is a very accomplished uh, Python developer, uh, as opposed mm -hmm. to me, who is a, not, uh, a very accomplished Python installer uh, and <laughs> copy paster. Um, but we're going to, yeah, we're going to write a Pulumi program to deploy some stuff to Azure and kind of go along and explain how this might be helpful and useful. Uh, and as questions come in, we'll we'll either answer them as they come or, or kind of catch towards the end, so. Let her rip. Yeah. Uh, yeah, definitely don't, um, if you have a question, you don't need to wait until the end at all. Uh, don't feel bad about interrupting me or interrupting Matt talking. Uh, a lot of this will be Matt talking while I'm writing code because I have, as I'm sure you may have noticed, an extremely loud keyboard <laughs> and uh, you can hear it in the next county. So I'm going to be writing some Python. We're going to, we're going to build I'm, a little Pulumi project. I'm kind Python. of the pundit here. Cat's like, cat's on the field and I'm the, the pundit. So color commentary. commentary. Color yeah. commentary. Well, yes. yeah. Miss Click Clack, I, I already have a question for you. And then I think it'll help you kind of kick off what you're going to be talking about. <laughs> okay. Uh, so Siegfried wants to know, please compare Python versus C Sharp for use with Balloon. So uh, for this use case, there isn't really um, like a functional difference. And in that's true for like most use cases. Uh, the thing about Pulumi is that it, the, the behavior is consistent regardless of which programming language you're using. So if you're more comfortable with C Sharp than you are with Python or TypeScript or Go, you can use C Sharp and the outcome is going to be the same. 
Uh, like there, there is an Azure native provider that works in C sharp, just like there's one that works in Python or Go or TypeScript. So it's it's um, it's not any different. There is no comparing to do uh, in that case, really, which uh, I think is great. Actually, that's that's really cool. That's super useful. Um, it's much more flexible that way. Um, it doesn't force you to like make a developer learn a language that they don't already know or that they don't really like, they don't really understand well, um, which is a benefit over using like a domain specific language. You can use whatever you're comfortable with. I will drop into the chat. So we're doing an example using Python with Azure. Um, there are a, uh, I'll put in the link that is basically a whole bunch of different bits of example code that um, are using C-sharp. And mm -hmm. if I poke around a little bit, if we have a little time, I might even be able to find the example that looks almost exactly like what Kat is doing. Mm. So. I think there's one in TypeScript and there there should be, I think there's one in C-sharp or you can at I, least drop them the C-sharp. I just, I just did the C-sharp. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I just actually did the... Uh, Azure, yeah, that should take them right to the examples repo. Actually, sorry, let's, there we go. Jay did it. Some, someone who could put in the main chat did it for me, but yes, yeah. we'll, we'll, we'll talk through that a little bit more, but yeah, but the idea now you may see some, <laughs> <laughs> as you look at examples, we don't necessarily have examples published for every use case with every level we're working on, on that, that just takes a little bit of time, but fundamentally the API reference is the same. The approach is the same. Uh, so, uh, it's whatever makes the most sense for you and what you know and what your team knows. Yeah. Which I don't know. I love that about it. Cause I don't know C sharp at all, but I do know Python pretty well and go tolerably well and TypeScript also tolerably well. So that's a lot of flexibility for me on There's any given team. There's a lot of team, you know? toleration there. Well, right, well let's, I, see, I let's see how well you know always... Python, Kat. Let's Ooh. do it. I, I hesitate to... Oh, I'm sorry, Kat. Uh, I just want to say I love the fact that we can uh, allow teams to use what they know rather than having to add a new DSL into or yeah. domain specific language into the way in that they're doing work. Sorry about interrupting. Please. No, you're good, buddy. Go. Yeah. Um, I do hesitate to call myself a good programmer, um, but here we go. You're the best trier. I, I try so hard and uh, that's that's ultimately what matters. We're just, we're here to make friends and try hard. So <laughs> shots fired, yeah. All right, so here we go. Um, I have moved all of this over into a GitHub repo for y'all. Um, I will drop this link in the StreamYard chat so um, Jay can share it with everyone if you want to follow along or if you want to do this later because I do, we do have this set up so that you can open it in Gitpod, which is what I'm gonna be working from today, which is really cool. This includes uh, two labs. We are gonna be going through this first one because it's it's relatively quick, but it's also relatively clear what's going on. Um, so let's get on over into the Gitpod. I have done a couple of things already here that are just you know kind of awkward to do on a live stream. I have logged into Pulumi with my uh, token, and I have also logged into the Azure CLI. Uh, the Gitpod um, is going to install the Azure CLI and Pulumi for you. Uh, go ahead, Matt. That's exactly what I was just going to say, that the Gitpod will have handled your prerequisites to doing this work is you need to have the Azure CLI installed, and you need to have Pulumi installed, which in this case, the Gitpod had that uh, for you, is what right. you just said. So that was helpful for me to say what you just said. <laughs> Thank you, Maddie. <laughs> I appreciate you. Uh, I, you're, you're here for backup. What Kat, Kat talked about needing to be logged into Pulumi. Uh, what that is, is so when you run a Pulumi program, it is going to have, it has to have somewhere to understand your state, right? Your state is, remember we talked about like test and repair. Like what is the state? Is the state where I want it to be or is it not? And Pulumi supports a bunch of different backends. You can store it in Azure Blob Storage. You can do it all sorts of different ways. The easiest way is to use our is to use the Pulumi service, um, which is free for individuals. And then that way, when and we'll we'll kind of cattle show you as we build some stuff, we'll be able to use the back end to sort of see what's happening besides just what we see in Azure. So a couple things Kat's doing here as I'm as I'm narrating. So every Pulumi program 
is basically a directory full of files. So she created a directory called IAC Workshop. And then while inside there, she ran the Pulumi New program. Now, Kat, can you back scroll the tiniest bit? I want them to see the, pro the, the command you put. Okay. She said new Azure Python. So there's different templates. So if you could just say, you could say, for example, Pulumi new Python, and that would generate a uh, Pulumi program that was scaffolded just for Python. In this particular case, there was an Azure one, which it did a few things. So like, uh, if you know um, anything about Python, which I know very little, but uh, there's that requirements.txt, right? So this is saying these are the libraries or the packages that are needed for this program. So because we did the Azure Python one, it added the Azure provider to, to that. So, um, and then one of the things, okay, you're going a little fast with a couple of things. So <laughs> uh, what the first thing, when it got created, it creates this pulumi.yaml. This is just the overall project configuration. And the only thing that really matters in here is the runtime. It says this project uses Python. Now, the other thing that happened is there's config so Pulumi has this idea of what we call stacks, and a stack is like an instance of your program. The first default stack is called dev. So when Cat had to set a configuration, which was what Azure location do I want to be in, it doesn't set that globally across the whole program because maybe you want to use it differently in dev versus pre-prod versus prod. So that created that pulumi.dev.yaml. So this is configuration that's specific to that particular stack. And um, Kat, I don't know what you did after that. What What is, <laughs> what is did you already start your program? Nope. Uh, okay. This is, uh, so what is happened? Is this still Pulumi new? Uh, yeah. So it is okay. installing all of my uh, requirements for okay. me now. Uh, it, it, I did not have to run a Pulumi up or a Pulumi new or whatever for that. It's uh, it's just going, installing the prereqs, which for some of these takes a little bit of time and there's not really anything Pulumi can do about that. It's a Python okay. thing, but now it's done and all of my requirements are installed in the virtual environment that I have not yet opened. Okay, so um, for that, because you're, you're getting, so you wanna speak a little bit about this virtual environment yeah. and how you're going to be working because this is very Python-y. This is and... very Python-y. So uh, I don't know C Sharp, so I can't comment on how, well, okay, I know how it works with dependencies, but um, so in Python, you don't install your dependencies uh, like globally like by the way you do with like JavaScript or TypeScript. Things exist inside of a virtual environment, inside of a bubble when you're working in a project, ideally. Now I can go and install all of these requirements globally, like in the entire this container, but that's bad practice. And we try to avoid doing that because it kind of gets really messy really quickly. If you so, wanted to, sorry, it, with C Sharp, it's a lot, I don't remember exactly, but like, for example, in Node, right? How you're, unless you specifically install a Node module globally, it installs it in just the context of the project. A Venn virtual environment in Python right. is like that, right? It's like that. So now I'm inside of the virtual environment. You just set your source to uh, this directory was created like by Pulumi. And that includes uh, a binary to activate the virtual environment. There are other ways to manage virtual environments in Python. This is the one that is built into Python. It's the one that that comes with it. But there are like third party packages that do it a little bit differently. So here we are inside of our virtual environment. If I wanted to install all of my requirements manually, which you may need to do if you end up on a new machine. You just do that. Uh, Pip three. What is, happened uh, to your? We lost yours. There you go. Okay. Uh, I muted it while I was typing the command. Oh, no, I was going <laughs> to yeah. say we lost. Okay. Oh, got it. Got it. Got it. Yeah. I, so you just go pip three install minus r requirements.txt, and that'll install all of your uh, prerequisites, all of your dependencies. However, Pulumi has already done it for us in this case as a part of creating the new project, which is really cool because I'm lazy. Yes. And then uh, you know it's standard. And then you know it's standard. So this is what Pulumi has created for us by default. This is the template that you get when you create an Azure Python project. It goes ahead and defines a resource group for us, imports some uh, dependencies, sets up an account, 
and exports the primary key of the storage account. This is the export that'll show that to us if we were to run Pulumi up. Uh, so when we run, so this is like Kat said, this is sort of a default program um, mm -hmm. that might be what you want. It might not be, but a couple things to look at when we kind of look back, if you scroll up a little bit, because again, by the fact that we're using a programming language, it lets us do a couple interesting things. So the first thing we want to do is we need a resource group. So that was kind of a boring little bit of code. It's just saying create an object called resource group and it's, it's a new resource group. But then where this gets interesting is if we look at the storage account. So if you look at line 12, you'll see you have to say for this storage account, what is the resource group I want? And we can refer to that programmatically because we created it and it has a parameter that is dot name. So this is the kind of thing we start to see about because we're using a general purpose programming language. Um, we can pass values around as those things get created, things we might not know what they're going to be. And that just continues all the way down, right? right? And then like Kat said, we with Pulumi, we have this idea of imports and exports. So an export is something that uh, maybe I want to pass that value back to the command line. Maybe I want to pass it to another Pulumi program. It's just getting something out of there. And in this case, it's just the primary key. We're going to do some more interesting things, though. Yeah. So first, I'm going to delete all of this and <laughs> uh, build some stuff like piece by piece so you can see how it yep. comes together. And also, more importantly, so that you can see how you can change a Pulumi program uh, after you've already stood it up. So let's start uh, by deleting absolutely everything. Bye. <laughs> and uh, retyping some of that exact code. <laughs> One of the things that as cat does, I want to point out is that you'll see there's uh, now at this point, this is just adding some, some Python packages, but when she starts to define resources, uh, you'll see that there's going to be some type ahead. Oh, look at that. Right. So equals resource dot. Um, you know, it, it can, uh, are you not getting that type ahead? Do you uh, need to save it so that it knows the package is? I have just saved it. It might okay. be that just like VS Code misbehaves inside okay. of the pod because it does do this if I like use VS Code natively. But yeah, we'll find out. Okay. So, but the point was there's no Pulumi plugin for VS Code. This is all because it's what's built into the programming language. So like uh, the packet, you know, whatever VS Code knows about what to do with the Pulumi Azure native uh, Python package, it can, it can VS code or your IDE in however way knows what to do with all that stuff. I think I don't want to go off on a tangent, but I go think ahead. this is a weird VS code thing where I think you needed to pip install those packages outside of the Ven oh. so that VS code knew they existed. You don't need to. Do oh, that. I remember running into this problem. This is a very Python specific yeah, thing. With this is VS a Python code. specific problem with VS code. But, yeah. But we're getting the idea. Okay. So what we had here, just to, again, all that we've got, we've created a resource group and then cats exporting its name. Um, and then when we run Pulumi up, what this is going to do is it's actually going to run something called Pulumi preview. So this is going to, it's not going to actually do anything. It's going to say, if I were to run this program, this is what would happen. I would create a new stack because we've never created that stack yet before. And I would create that resource group. And if you were to, if cat were to go into details as the option, it will, uh, oh, you could do this too. Um, also the other difference too, like this is the, on the, we talked about seeing the back end. So, uh, everything that we're seeing there is available on the web. So if you were to click the diff, I think that would show you, you can actually see the very detailed specific things of what it's going to do now. I want to, okay, go, let's go ahead and, and run our Pulumi up. Okay. So this is now going to reach out there. Now, one of the things that you didn't see us do, but just so you know, like, Kat said we sort of like the environment variables have already been set to what Azure tenant and the service principle to use this. There's, it all depends on how you um, create how you this. Connect. Yeah. And there's yes. like a little bit of weirdness with accessing uh, the Azure CLI from inside of the Git pod. So that's, that's why we use the, set up the yep. environment variables yep. beforehand. So we saw that we had in the output, it output, it said it created a resource group that's called my resource group. And then there's, 
kind of this identifier at the end, but it's like, but wait a minute. If we look at line four, we called it my dash resource group. We didn't call it my resource group 5B614682. So how did that happen? <laughs> Uh, so we go ahead and add a like uh, semi randomly generated. It's just it's a it's a UUID yep. to the end of the name for purposes of avoiding collisions. Uh, this is not as controversial as it sounds. This is a thing that we like we do by default, but you can overrule this. It doesn't it doesn't have to be this way. Uh, I am keeping it that way for ease of like the code being more readable and you know one less thing for me to explain in an introduction to a whole like tool and potentially concept that you're unfamiliar with but uh just know that this is the default behavior but you can overrule it if you want like a, a unique human readable name for each resource group, or, which is what i a, do or a unique but, if you know it has to be unique and there are definitely yeah. cases where you want that yes jay hey i'm back and welcome back hey thanks well we have a question yeah came. let's go our lovely audience. Uh, Basilio asks, is it possible to create Python libraries to create libraries that manage the creation and maintenance of my resources so I can just define the resources in the stack a, uh, YAML file? What do you say? Uh, you can get very, very close to doing that. Yeah. Like, So actually, to be honest, you could if you have all of those things are set as configuration parameters. Uh, actually, I'm going to take a step back when I say you can get very, very close. And I'm actually going to say that is actually exactly how you should, one of the ways you should use Pulumi, right? Which is that those values are all set as configuration. So we're not seeing, like, for example, the, the value that cat set of the region, the Azure provider uses that natively. So we don't yeah. have to do anything, but we can write code. Inside our code, we can grab any of the values from the configuration. That yeah, and I'll show that later on in this. Oh, like, there, there, okay. Yeah, there is a point where I like I change something from, I, I will change something from okay. like hard-coded to okay. a config value. So I can show yep. you exactly how we do that. Perfect, and, then we uh, will then uh, we will absolutely uh, be covering that. Uh, so great question. Yeah. Um, cool, okay, what are you gonna do? So we got our resource group. Um, yeah. You can also do this, I'd like to point out. Um, Oh, so you can like at any point see the outputs of your stack if you need to use them for something else. And those are accessible to like to other things. So if you want to grab the output of a stack and consume it uh, in some other way, like if you need some other application to consume the output of a Pulumi program, you can do that because uh, it's just like there vibing with the Pulumi stack output, Yep, which is pretty neat. But yes, now we are going to add some more stuff to this infrastructure. We're going to add a storage account. So Matt, I'm going to mute myself. Yep. And oh, wait, no. Yeah, I, mean, I got to mute myself. That's fine. I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll talk it through as we go. OK, so this is going to look similar. But again, remember that uh, when we create a storage account, so now we have to add storage because import, we had just imported from the provider just those particular parts of the library. So now we're going to say, okay, we're going to you know, name it. We're going to call it account. It's going to be a storage, a storage account. And again, we give it a name, which it's going to have uh, a unique identifier at the end of it. By the way, we're not going to show it because I don't know enough about what's in our Azure to know if we're going to create a conflict. But you see how... Uh, all of these things that are happening, uh, these are all the arguments or the parameters. One of those parameters is name. So if you set that where you see how, for example, she said skew equals blah, blah, blah. At that same level, if cat said name equals cat is awesome, then, then the auto naming goes away and it just becomes named that. That said, unless you have a really strong reason like we have something else that picks up and, you know, like maybe I've got something that's managed outside of Pulumi that needs to know that this, you know, uh, CloudFront uh, endpoint or whatever, sorry, now I'm talking about AWS, whatever, is called exactly this, then you could do that. Okay, I see uh, Bob Kusumoto asks, are there Pulumi specific extensions for VS Code? And mm -hmm. there are not. And the reason is there's, I have yet to figure out what one would be that we don't get automatically just from the programming language. Yeah. So um, this is sure. again, because of we're not getting the type ahead because the, the way it got set up and this might be a little bit of the thing, but like if usually you would be getting all of the type ahead that like when 
Cat starts to do dot storage account, it will know all of those because it's Python. The Python interpreter, I guess, is the right word, or the language host uh, reads it from the package. Um, so, okay, something happened. Uh, I have a typo somewhere is what's going on. Is it called uh, resource? Oh, ha, 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 ha. You, know, oh, yeah, you always can love when you're doing it live and yeah. You, you, um, you honestly, make... I have had, uh, I've had a live demo, like a live coding thing go flawlessly one time, wow. one time. And I was so uncomfortable the whole time. Yeah, like, like I actually don't like it. It's like when you build Ikea furniture and there's parts left over and you're like, oh no. Yeah. Like, <laughs> I, but I it's, feel sturdy. Like, but yeah. it's sturdy. Yeah. <laughs> It just, it feels like live coding. There's, there should always be something that goes wrong. Like I should fat finger something, right? Like, otherwise it, I don't know. We learn from failure, don't we? We do, we do. And part of like, that's part of our job, right? Like you get to watch me make a mistake live and debug it, which is cool. So, so okay. So this went, now we got, uh, now, so this is, if you want to just really quick for fun, Kat, you want to bop over to the console? Uh, the Plumy console, because now we've done a couple things so we can see our history. So go back to, yep. So we had our dev stack and we can see none of this is terribly interesting, but if you look at activity, we can see the two times that cat ran Plumy up and what changed. So uh, the changes, we can see that. And again, the timeline, it'll show us everything that happened. Uh, actually timeline might be interesting. Um, so you can see it ran this. Now here's a fun one, which I don't think is going to look. Go to resources at the, at the top and click the graph view. Now, there's not a whole lot of resources in our Pulumi program, so this is not a terribly interesting graph. But as dependencies start to happen, this view becomes very, very interesting. Um, so that's all fun stuff that happens on the... Um, uh, the back end, uh, uh, especially if you're using the Pulumi SAS. If you're if you are just storing your state in blob storage, you don't have all of that wonderful stuff. All right, so we're gonna get uh, okay. We're gonna export out the storage account name um, because we want to know what it is. Yeah, um, just because we need that. I'm not gonna run another Pulumi up. For yeah, it, just to get that. We'll yeah, see it later. and and uh, and actually, I think if you did a Pulumi preview, you would actually get the name because it knows it. So do a Plumi up, but don't run. Or just do Plumi up, but just don't run it. Yeah, like don't 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 uh, apply it. But I think it will give you that value. Um, yes. So you can say no. We don't need to. We don't need to run a whole up just to get that value back. But um, cool. What are we doing next? We gonna... We're gonna actually throw a container at the container at it. Like oh, a, a container, container like. The yeah, a blob container, not blob like a Docker container. container. Yes. Yeah. As we say here, throw it. Yeah. We're gonna throw it. Throw. We're gonna throw. <laughs> we're gonna throw a couple two tree containers at it. Hey, you know, <laughs> do what you gotta do. So, again, and what we're what we're getting to at this point is eventually getting some some you know basically creating kind of a uh, a static set of stuff. Now, this is not necessarily a thing you might do as part of the stuff that you're building, but you're seeing how these building blocks go together. Okay, I see a question in the chat from Anais says, I dropped in late. How would I get started with Pulumi? Well, one way uh, Hi, Anais. <laughs> is you could actually just go to, I believe it's as easy as Pulumi. Let's see if I can do it. Is it getting... If, oh, oh, oh my goodness. Okay, I'm going to have to have a conversation that plumi.com slash getting started. Oh, oh my it's, God, does it's, it not work? No, we need to redirect. I will, here's is the that link. Is on Anais? Oh, it is. It Hi, is. Anais. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they they said nice things about you already. Um, I, I just put in the chat, so the link for our getting started. Um, there's a bunch of, of tutorials. There's also a really, uh, we have uh, some learning paths. I'm also going to put these links in that... Um, Somebody who can get them to the rest of the world will share them. Yep. Thanks, Reactor folks. Um, yes. <laughs> uh, so the learn path uh, will go through Plumi Fundamentals. And actually right now, I think they're mostly written. Those uh, workshops or tutorials are happen to be in Python, but we're adding uh, the other languages to them uh, as, as we speak. Okay. So 
Uh, we put the blob container and basically just made a container called file. So there's nothing in it yet, but now we have it. It'll go ahead and create that relatively quick. And now you'll see the blob container name. It couldn't, in the preview, it couldn't tell us what that output was because it didn't exist. It hadn't been created. But now, again, I'm pointing at my screen and you can definitely see what I'm pointing at. We can see that it has a value. Um, cool. Should we put some files in there? Is that what we're going to do next? Uh, this is, no, this is oh. where we're going to start talking about um, using Polumi's config. Oh, yeah. Um, so there, there is the the lab two for this uh, does in, get more complicated and involve like a serverless application, but we don't have time for that. So instead, we're going to talk about uh, using Pulumi config to make this like a little bit more flexible. So you saw me uh, early on when I was setting this up, set a config value via like the Pulumi CLI. It was asking which region I wanted to deploy this in. And I left it at the, the default, which is West US. Now you can change that. And that's one of the configs that Pulumi just like, just handles by itself. You don't have to import Pulumi config uh, in your code to do that one. But if I want any of these hard coded names to be a little bit more flexible, I want it to be a variable. Maybe it depends on whether this is dev or prod or um, you know, you just decide that you want something to be named differently for whatever reason or you're importing a value from another application and it needs to be able to change. It's not static. Uh, we do that with Pulumi config. So that is- This is, yeah, a little yeah. bit like the question that came up about could I define things in the config and then, you know, so someone would just have to create a stack and they wouldn't, you know, to, to get the thing they wanted. And that's honestly quite a bit of how um, a lot of Plumi programs that you share within your organization will work. Yeah. So right now our blob container is just called files. So like we're, we're clearly just using it for like flat file storage, right? We're throwing like whatever cat pictures in there. But um, maybe I want this to uh, be a little bit more flexible than that. So instead of giving it a name explicitly, we just do this. Okay, so now if I try to run Pulumi up, this is going to barf. Because I am not giving it a required config value. As I've said here, like this is this is a hard requirement. I I need to be explicitly told what to call this before Pulumi can touch it. So it yelled at me. So which then that's helpful if you know that your program you're writing, you want people, they, they, they won't have the ability to run the Plumi program without setting those. And it also does give even the command, you'll see it says set a value using the command, Plumi config set. You could do it uh, manually in the YAML yourself if you felt so inclined, but you know. Um, now, one of the other things we're not going to dig into right now, but the reason of that, so Cal, go ahead and set that. Um, you can also set values that are encrypted, that are secrets. And if a config value is set as secret, it will be encrypted in the config file, but also Pulumi knows to never, ever, ever show that value in a log or in a stream or anything like that. So, um, those kind of, uh, where those kind of go in now in this case, cool. So yeah, so now it's, uh, holding it by container name. So we should see. And again, it do, Pulumi doesn't know in the preview because it hasn't evaluated to know what that actual name is going to be yet. Um, even though you would think it could because we set it in the config, but because it has to evaluate the program and see what happens uh, with the cloud resources. Um, I think you're still in your... I hopped over to the uh, yeah. output from this to no, but I was like, was it this run or was it the run? Mm -hmm. It was this one. Oh, yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah, it was this one. Got it. So uh, you can see here that all it did was change uh, files, which was the hard coded name before, to HTML, which is the name I gave it through config. So uh, and that that holds true for like literally anything in here i mean like i guess in theory you could like write most of this through configs but it would be really awkward and uh inconvenient and 
over the top. And now that I think about it, that's like super stupid and I'm probably going to do it for fun. Well, you could, I mean, but if you think about it, cause there's, this is the, where the abstractions come in, right? So like there's certain things that you, you know, your subject matter expert who writes a Plumy program, who knows, like when we set up these things, there's the dials that people can change and the dials that they can't. Right. I, I, uh, this is, this is the example I used to give a long time ago, which will date me because I'm going to talk about Tomcat for a minute, oh, man. but I might say, <laughs> let's say I was writing a program, uh, to get an instance of Tomcat and I'm the, you know, Tomcat genius. Like, so I know the 150 different configuration things you could set. Cat just wants an instance of Tomcat and knows three things that she wants to set about it. So, uh, one of the ways you could think about it is in your Pulumi program, you're defining the shape of the dial. And mm -hmm. then in the config, people say what I want the dial set to. But you also don't have to expose every configuration uh, as something that someone can set. Because you might say, for example, uh, the region. You're like, nope, we just insist that everything's in West US. I mean, please don't do that. Please but, don't do that. You know, it doesn't, you don't necessarily have to allow that to be overridden. But then again, you might say the name of it is a different thing. So, yeah. yeah. So, uh, I have created not a whole bunch of resources, but, you know, some resources on Azure that are now sitting there on my, uh, like, employer's Azure account, just vibing. Um, but I don't want them to be there anymore um, because I don't want to get yelled at for clobbing up our Azure account with a bajillion <laughs> resources from workshops. So what if I'm done working on this and I want it gone? You just run Pulumi destroy and we get a little preview of the things that it's going to delete. Just like every time we stood something up uh, just to, just to make sure that you actually want to delete these, these things say yes. And it goes, this one takes usually, I don't know, a minute ish uh tops this one's actually it's going pretty fast so cool well uh, while is... you wait for that in mm -hmm. the minute ish we could use your help answering a question if that's cool let's go uh because we've got we've got plenty of time for questions now um sure demola asks can pulumi help in a situation where uh there is already resources created in azure or does it need to be created from scratch with pulumi so it doesn't need to be created from scratch with Pulumi, right, Matt? Like it already has, like the resources have names and stuff and IDs. Oh. Like if you can do it through the Azure CLI, you should be able to. I want to kind of Pulumi. where there's already resources created. Oh, I think I understand what yeah. the, no, the question is. What you would need to do and what you can do is so you can import. Yeah. So Pulumi can only manage things that you've told it about. But you can point Pulumi towards your infrastructure and it will slurp in those existing resources and then you can start to manage them in state. Yeah. So like you said, if there's already resources created in Azure, you can um, can get from that. Yes. Yeah. So it's not you're not stuck like starting over from scratch or whatever just because you want to switch to Pulumi. Like if, the, if you're using something else to manage your infrastructure, there's there is a way to import that into Pulumi or like if you can manage it with the Azure CLI, it's yeah, same thing. Cause this is, this is a native provider that we're using. So. So actually that's a really good point. Let's talk about that for one second. So the provider, when we call a native provider in Pulumi, what happens is the Azure provider is built basically nightly from the API spec from Azure. So that means as soon as Azure exposes a new functionality in We've got Azure, it. you know, within 24 hours, you can use it in Pulumi. Yeah. Um, and there are even certain things that are not exposed through that API spec uh, that are still in our provider. So when we look for stuff where we're like, okay, there might be a feature in Azure that is just not through the, through the, the, uh, through that spec that we can build. Um, it still ends up getting handled, but the vast majority of it comes from that. So that's actually a really uh, powerful thing about the native provider and the Azure one, especially. Yeah. So um, does anybody have any questions for us? Comments, vibes? Problems with your life. I mean, yeah, if you've got problems with your life you want to talk about, um, Matt and I are, we're here to listen to you. <laughs> this therapy session just got weird. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, God, I'm so glad my therapist isn't a software engineer. 
I, I would be, I would just talk about work all the time. <laughs> you know? Sure. So uh, we've got like about 10 minutes left. I just want okay. to keep you abreast on time. So why don't you yeah. show us what you got? Well, so we showed the, okay. So you've, you know, we, we've cleaned up after ourselves. Now, one of the things before you, so Kat, why don't you go? So you'll see, like it said, it said the resources are deleted, but no, 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 don't do that. Yet. I'm going to go, I'm going to go look at it. First. That's what I wanted to say. Yeah. I was going to say, we actually, even though all those resources got deleted, we still have we still all of the history, all of the things that happened, you know, yeah. so if we went and ran it, but. You know, in this case, you know, Kat really, you know, just wants this gone. So we can actually delete the entire stack and then all of that history and everything is gone. Is, is gone. You know, which, to be honest, this is a thing that you, you know, deleting a stack like this is a thing as a developer advocate and someone who does demos does all the time in real life. You should not. Very rarely, right? Unless you're just like, this whole project is over. You know, we we built a new feature and like it's just dead. It's just gone. But yeah, yeah. So now then now, this... if you re you should four hundred four, I think. Yeah, if right. I refresh this, it'll four hundred four. Yeah, because yeah. the now stack's that just gone. Stack is not even there. Yeah. So this organization does not have a project named IAC Workshop because it's just I nuked it from Orbit, so it's gone. You just see my other ones. So there's a couple things I would say as well, if there aren't questions and stuff, um, I will give a link. If you go to palumi.com slash resources, that's going to be a lot of, you know, kind of upcoming, whether they're streams or conferences or workshops or things that, that, that we've got going or recordings of past ones, um, to keep an eye on that, uh, we do, uh, if you want to learn more Pulumi stuff, um, if you go to youtube.com slash Pulumi TV, we have a couple series, Modern Infrastructure Wednesday, Quick Bites of Cloud Engineering, and every Thursday we stream at uh, twitch.tv slash Um, So if you tune in tomorrow afternoon, I will be... I apparently decided I'm taking my personal website that's built in Hugo and I'm going to write Pulumi code to deploy it to some cloud providers somewhere. And we're just going to see how it goes. It's not going to be a slick demo. It's just going to be Maddie live coding. So, you know, come in and maybe I'll give out prizes or something. I'll figure something out. Oh, I'm in heckle prize. at the minimum. People yeah. love prizes. Yeah. People love prizes. Um, well, yep. any last minute questions for us about Pulumi, about infrastructure as code, about being developer advocates, about Twitter? <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's a... Well, you know, it looks like right now we are just about out of questions. We're going to ask our audience if you have anything left to ask about Pulumi um, or Azure or Azure and Pulumi, feel free. Uh, if not, we can start wrapping up. Hi, Rebecca. Hey, I figured I'd pop on and do my survey thing while we wait to see if there's any questions that come through in the interim. So I dropped into the chat just a survey. We ask our audience who you are. Just tell us a little bit about you um, because we build our content around our audience. So uh, just let us know a little bit about your learning level, what interests you have, et cetera, et cetera. And then um, if you are not familiar with the Microsoft Reactor program, if you're tuning in from another channel, do feel free to find us, check us out. We're, we have on-demand content on YouTube from all of our live sessions. We post them over there. Um, you can find us on Twitter. We are on Meetup. We have 12 physical spaces around the world. So find your time zone that works for you and, and check us out. And that's that. I think, um, Jay, did you have anything else to follow up with? or? No, I, I just wanted to say uh, thanks a lot to both Kat and to Maddie. We, we had a really good time. We learned a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, I, I think that if you wanted to find a new way to deploy your applications and not have to learn a new language, this really will just hit your, uh, your zone. So definitely check out Pulumi, check out all the resources that we provided you with today. Um, both Kat and Matt, thank you so much today for being part. And so 
I'm going to ask you, Kat, first, uh, where can people find you on the internet? Ooh. Oh. You can, where can't they find you on the internet? Where can't you find me on the internet? I am um, constantly online in a way that is um, – <laughs> potentially unhealthy but you can find me on twitter <laughs> at uh, dixie 3 flatline uh, you may also attempt to send me an email at cat at palumi.com i am notoriously super bad at responding to those so good luck i love the uh the terminally online we are a a, a good breed we, uh, matt, we're doing our best jay yeah, that's yes so I, I agree hey matt um same question uh, where can everybody find you on the internet? Yeah, same same thing as Kat. So you'll find me on Twitter at Matt Stratton. That's the easiest way to hunt me down. You can, uh, if you want to uh, work on something together, Palumi related or whatnot, we always, I love collaborating, uh, either writing blog posts, doing a stream, doing a video. I am Maddie at Palumi.com. Uh, I check, I Read my email maybe more frequently than Kat. I even sometimes but, uh, star it and me to. Do you re respond to that? No, I star it to respond to it, and then I don't. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Actually, if you if you need something, and we're joking, but if you want to collaborate on something, another thing, if you do want to do collaborating, if you send an email to da like developer advocates at palumi.com, that'll come to our whole team, and we would love to work on stuff with you. Stuff yeah. like this is great. We do streams, we do videos, we do blogs. Um, if you're doing something awesome. Let's let's do something together. Yeah, and if you, you forget all those email addresses, just find us on Twitter. Yeah, and we'll you don't have out. to be a professional speaker or like an internet hotshot or whatever to like do something with us. If you yeah. are just like a software engineer doing a cool thing and you would like to collaborate with us or just use us as a resource, you can. Please reach yep. out. We'd love to. Sounds great. Well, I think we're ready to close up shop. Uh, I really have enjoyed this and I know our uh, our viewers have like francis just sent us a note and said thanks for the fun intro to palumi uh, welcome francis. thanks for watching francis um and i think that's about it i just want to give a big shout out to rebecca who helps put all these together thank you so much rebecca thank you guys and thanks everyone and thanks for tuning in until the next time